Hello everyone, welcome to the very first episode of My Book of Mormon. So my name is David Michael, I'll be your host for this podcast. If you haven't figured it out, the intent here is to read the Book of Mormon cover to cover for the very first time, so I've never read it before, and let you know what I think as I go. So you may be wondering, why would someone want to do that? Well, I uh, I, don't know, I find religion, just religious belief, fascinating. You know, just just the fact that so many people from around the world believe so fervently in these different things, I uh, I don't know, it fascinates me. So I have in my life read, I've read the Bible cover to cover. I've read, I'm not completely cover to cover, but I've read large parts of the Quran. And, and this is one I just haven't tackled. A lot of people believe in it. So I kind of wanted to read it and say, all right, let's see, let's see what this thing has to say. And, uh, and yeah, and just comment as I go. So when I read the Bible and the Quran, you know, there were just, there were times that, you know, I would just be thinking things and I would almost make myself laugh as I said it. And so I kind of wished that, you know, maybe I could go, could, could have had a, a mechanism to record my thoughts, right? So I'm going to attempt that here. Uh, as I read, I'll just kind of whatever pops in my head, I'm going to say it out loud. And hopefully that, that makes it a more entertaining, uh, prospect to, to listen to a religious book cover to cover. Full disclosure, I've actually recorded the first episode already. So I kind of recorded the episode and now I'm doing the intro and I'll just tack it onto the front. So I, I, I am aware of what's in this first chapter. And I'll say that I, I no longer wish that I had done this with the Bible and the Quran because quite frankly, it wouldn't have been very exciting, right? There's just large sections of those books that are boring, uh, terribly boring. But this so far has started out, I mean, just absolutely crazy. I mean, just insanity is written in here. So I'm, I mean, I'm excited almost to, to get to the next chapters because I was just, just reading so far, my, my jaw's been just dropped open. In fairness, if I had never, you know, if I knew nothing about what was in the Bible when I read it, it might have been just as shocking. So it, it is the fact that I've never read this. I don't know what's in it. But yeah, so far, if you don't know what's in it, you're you're in for a fun ride because it's it's it started out with a bang. So yeah, I hope the rest of the book continues to be as entertaining, uh, and I hope that my commentary adds to that entertainment. So that's why I'm why I'm doing this and what you should expect from it. I'll also say that, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff I don't know as we go. Uh, so we're going, I'm going to be learning on the way, right? Again, this is, this, this is an educational purpose as well as entertainment purpose. So yeah, I, I hope that each episode will learn some new things about what this, what this is all about. Um, some things I might have to table and say, okay, I'll look that up and let you know by next episode and I'll try and stay true to those, uh, when there's things that just, I don't know and have to look up. But yeah, so I'm pretty excited. The other thing, I, I, I do hope to eventually start having guests come on, so not to just do this by myself, but to get some some other people to sit down with me that can can add some color commentary there. It, probably for the first five to ten, it'll be just me, so I kind of just want to get get some legs under this thing before I start uh, branching out like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you don't have to listen to just me the whole time. Eventually, we'll get some uh, some other voices, some other opinions, some other points of view, and uh, to, you know, make it even even more enjoyable for the listener. Okay, one very last thing before we get started. Um, I would love to hear your comments for what you're uh, thinking. Any listeners out there who want to send me a comment, send me a message, a question, whatever you want, there's a few different ways to do that. One is to uh, go to my website slash blog. That is mybookofmormonpodcast.com. Then you can see all of the episodes posted there, which you can uh, leave comments. Another way is to go to my Facebook page. So that would be uh, www.facebook.com slash my book of Mormon podcast. Again, all one word. And yeah, leave a post message, anything you want there. Or you can uh, email me directly at comments at my book of Mormon podcast.com. So three different ways to get a hold of me. Uh, let me know what you think. Um, also, if you are going to leave me a message, uh, especially email, let me know if it's something that uh, I can share on a future episode. I'd love to be able to read your comments or questions on the air, so to speak, so that we can uh, have everyone. But if, but if it's a private comment or a private question, just, uh, you know, if you don't say that I can use it specifically, then I'll, I'll assume it's private. So, okay. So without further ado, I think we will just go ahead and get started. So here we are about to begin reading the Book of Mormon on this podcast, My Book of Mormon. And thank you for joining us. All right. 
right, it's time to get started. We are on page one of the Book of Mormon. So here we go. The Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon. Huh. Mormon was a person, apparently. Well, something. Anyway, something or someone named Mormon wrote this, so hence the name Book of Mormon. All right. Uh, an account written by the hand of Mormon upon plates taken from the plates of Nephi. Nephi? Nephi? N-E-P-H-I. Okay, so... Hand of Rome, Mormon wrote on plates from whatever. Okay. Wherefore, it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi, and also of the Lamanites, written to the Lamanites, who are a remnant of the house of Israel. Oh, okay, let's break that down. Uh, so we have the Nef Nephi, who are a part of the Lamanites, and the Lamanites are a part of Isra Israelites. Ooh, so there you go. A sect within a sect. And also to Jew and Gentile. Hey, that's me. Written by the way of commandment, and also by the spirit of prophecy and of revelation. Written and sealed up, and hid up unto the Lord, that they might not be destroyed. To come forth by the gift and power of God into the interpretation thereof. Sealed by the hand of Moroni. Okay. And hid up unto the Lord, and come forth in due time by way of the Gentile. The interpretation thereof by the gift of God. All right, so this is um, apparently a, a record of these people, the the, Nef, the, the Nephi. We're going to say Nephi. Sounds good. Uh, no, Nephi. I'm say, sorry. I keep going back and forth. Nephi. We'll say Nephi. So the Nephi, we're going to hear about them. Uh, hopefully they're a fun group of people, uh, up to the hijinks and whatnot. Let's hope. So uh, this won't be too boring. And uh, so that was all written down and then hidden for some reason. Uh, and then later a Gentile was going to find it and God would translate it for him is what I'm gathering from all that. So, all right. Uh, let's, I can't wait to hear about these fun Nephites. Uh, next paragraph. An abridgment taken from the book of Ether also, book of Ether, which is a record of the people of Jared. Oh, Jared and his folk. That's hopefully they're as fun as the, the Nephi. Who were scattered at the time the Lord confounded the language of the people when they were building a tower to get to heaven. Okay, so the Jareds were the only ones that were building the tower, I guess? Yeah, yeah. So apparently, which I assume is the same story as the uh, Tower of Babel, um, apparently the Jareds were the ones that were building it, and they were the ones who got their languages all messed up. So now they guess they can't talk to each other. All right, uh, which is to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers and that they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast off forever. And also to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. And now, if there are faults, there are mistakes of men. <laughs> Wherefore, condemn not the things of God, that ye may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. All right, so apparently, um, these Jareds, they, you know, they got screwed. They got kind of screwed with, you know, they lost their language. Uh, but it's saying all hope is not lost for them um, because they can be forgiven too. Oh, huh, very nice. And then uh, it says at the bottom, translated by Joseph Smith, comma, J-U-N. Does that mean like in June or is that like, I don't know, June, June. Hmm. So that was, that was the beginning. Um, now this is odd. I just read that. And the next page then says introduction. So I guess the last page was like an intro to the intro. There you go. Okay, the Book of Mormon is a volume of Holy Scripture comparable to the Bible. Oh, great. I hope it's better than the Bible, because that, that one's pretty hard to read. It is a record of God's dealings with the ancient inhabitants of the Americas, and contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Well, there you go. You know, we, we heard all about... God's dealings in the uh, Middle East and the Bible, and now we're going to hear about it in America. There you go. The book was written by many ancient prophets by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. Their words, written on gold plates, were quoted and abridged by a prophet historian named Mormon. There he is. So they, their words were quoted and abridged. So the ancient prophets, this Mormon guy, wrote down their words, abridged, apparently. They must have gone on and on. Um, and wrote them on gold plates. Okay. The record gives an account of two great civilizations. One came from Jerusalem in 600 B.C., and afterwards separated into two nations known as the 
Nephites and the Lamanites. Oh, no, this is odd. Oh, before I thought Nephite were a part of the Lamanites. Apparently, they're two different tribes, I guess, from Israel. So, sorry about that confusion earlier. So, yeah, the, the, the Nephites um, and the Lamanites are two different nations, um, both offshoots of Israel that, that became an offshoot in 600 B.C. No, okay. Uh, the other, okay, gives two great civilizations, one from Jerusalem, uh, known as the Nephites and the Lamanites. Okay, wait, what? So it's an account of two great civilizations. One of them was Nephites and Lamanites. So that sounds like two, but oh well. So the first one is Nephites and Lamanites. The other came much earlier when the Lord confounded the tongues at the Tower of Babel. This group is known as the Jaredites. After thousands of years, all were destroyed except the Lamanites, and they were among the ancestors of the American Indians. Well, if everybody else dies, why do I care? I mean, why don't we just hear about the Lamanites? I mean, nobody, history's written by the victors, right? I don't know. And, uh, yeah, so the Lamanites are among the ancestors of the American Indians. Among them. That's interesting. I mean, I guess we could just, like, take some DNA samples, right, and, and trace the lineage back and see if we've got any uh, that tra go back to Israeli lineage. I wonder if that's been done. Something tells me it has, and something tells me that there's no sign. I'm guessing. But that, yeah, that would add up. But if that's the case, why would anyone still believe this? That wouldn't, that wouldn't make any, I don't know. We'll find out. I'll look, I will look that up before our next episode. If anyone has attempted to, uh, trace the, any of the American Indian, I thought we were supposed to say Native American now, but you know, this book was written a little while ago, so probably they didn't know the right PC word. All right, we'll, we'll see. Okay, the crowning event recorded in the Book of Mormon is the personal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ among the ne Nephites soon after his resurrection. He puts forth the doctrines of the gospel, outlines the plan of salvation, and tells men what they must do to gain peace in this life and eternal salvation in the next to come. Okay, uh, so Jesus came to the Nephites after his resurrection and told them all this great stuff, but they didn't make it. They all died. Right? Because it said that only the Lamanites survive. So, did Jesus talk to the Lamanites? Or did he, did he bet on the wrong tribe? Alright. After Mormon completed his writings, he delivered the account to his son Moroni. Hey, we heard of Moroni earlier, so that's cool. Who added a few words of his own. <laughs> that's great. Uh, yeah. So he's just like, yeah, I'm gonna tweak this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a chapter. A little Moroni chapter here. Um, and hid up the plates in the hill Camorra. He hid them. Well, it did say in the in the last chapter, I guess, that they were hidden. On September 21st, 1823, the same Moroni, then a glorified resurrected being, appeared to Prophet Joseph Smith and instructed him relative to the ancient record and its destined translation into the English language. Do people really believe this? This is this is insanity. So the guy named Mormon wrote down a bunch of stuff that he'd heard from other prophets, right? Gave it to his son, Moroni, who then threw, you know, added some words of his own, hit it, and then thousands of years later, Moroni came back as some type of ghost and said, hey, Joseph Smith, I'm going to help you translate this. That that's That's crazy talk. I mean, I'm sorry if I'm disrespectful to anyone that believes this, but whoa. You, you know what would have been better? It would have been better if they hadn't hit it. Right? So, if someone had written all this down and said, yeah, Jesus went to talk to the Native Americans and this is what he told them and everyone, you know, at the time in Israel would have been saying, what is a Native American? And then thousands of years later, when Columbus comes across and we find it, suddenly they'd be like, whoa, this book where they might be true because, I mean, they called this out. They knew these people existed. Nobody else did. Yeah, but that's not how it happened. For some reason, they hit it with those people. Hmm, that makes that makes sense. So probably the easiest way to make this credible would been would have been to not hide it. And why would you hide it, right? If this is like, hey, this is what we have to do to get saved. But if you were a human being that lived before eighteen twenty three, sorry, out of luck. Hmm, sorry, just uh, it was hidden, so you couldn't know. So I guess you're gonna die. Yeah, this is this is this is a, a bunch of nonsense. Um. 
I don't know. May, you know, maybe they're just dropping us. Like, here's the high level. We're getting the details. We're going to make our case later. M- maybe that that's what's going on. But that's, wow. Okay. In due course, the plates were delivered to Joseph Smith, who translated them by the gift and power of God. The record is now published in many languages, and a new and additional witness that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, that all who will come unto him and obey the laws and ordinances of his gospel may be saved. Sorry, I got a little stuck there in the middle. All right, so we don't really know how Joseph... So Joseph Smith, this ghost named Moroni, showed him where these plates were. I mean, once he had them, he just somehow was God's like, yeah, you can read this language now, whatever, whatever it was. And he put it in English. So, wow. People believe this. <laughs> People believe this happened. Okay. Concerning this record, the prophet Joseph Smith said, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by aiding by its precepts than by any other book. Sure. Well, because he said it, it must be true. The most correct of any book on earth. You know, if if anyone ever looks at you and says, this is the greatest truth ever, I don't care what they're talking about. Question that. Raise an eyebrow. Say, is it? Yeah, because that that seems unlikely. In addition to Joseph Smith, the Lord provided for 11 others to see the gold plates for themselves and to be special witnesses of the truth and divinity of the Book of Mormon. This is great. So, for the billions of people that live on earth, we don't have to take one person's word for it, Right? Because 11 other people saw the plates. I mean, did they? could they translate them too? Or they just said, yes, there are in fact gold plates. Because <laughs> I could make some gold plates. Wow, so bad. Um, the written testimonies are included herewith as the testimonies of the three witnesses and the testimony of the eight witnesses. But we have to read those? I guess we're going to have to read those. It says it's included. We invite all men everywhere to read the Book of Mormon. Well, congratulations, we have accepted your offer because here we are reading it. To ponder in their hearts the message it contains. Well, yeah, I'm going to ponder in my brain, because my heart just pumps blood. There's no pondering that happens there, but good try. And then to ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if the book is true. Do I do that at the end? Or can I do it now? Hmm. Those who pursue this course and ask in faith will gain a testimony of its truth and divinity by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, okay. We'll see. We we will see. I I don't think that's going to happen to me so far. If this was your initial, you know, sales pitch, this was your grab, that's <laughs> not looking good for you because that so far it sounds pretty bizarre. Those who gain this divine witness from the Holy Spirit will also come to know by the same power that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that Joseph Smith is his revelator. Revelator. That sounds like a movie. Joseph Smith, the revelator. Uh, and prophet in these last days, and that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's kingdom once again established on the earth, preparatory to the second coming of the Messiah. Now that, my friends, is an intro. Really got me, got me going. Okay, be it known, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just started reading the next one, I should say what it is. We have now moved on, we're past the introduction. We have now entered into the testimony of three witnesses. So they, they didn't make us wait, they said it's coming, and here it is. So testimony three. Oh, this looks really boring. All right, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through this as fast as I can. Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, unto whom this work shall come, that we, through the grace of God of the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, have seen the plates which contain this record, which is a record of the people of Nephi, and also of the Lamanites, their brethren, and also of the people of Jared, who came from the tower from which they had spoken. Right, and we also know that they have been translated by the gift and power of God. For his voice hath declared it to us. Okay, I gotta, I gotta interject. So remember before we said, so they saw some gold plates. Good for them. How do they know what it says? Only Joseph Smith apparently could translate them. Well, apparently, somehow God spoke to them in His voice and said, "These plates are real." So cool. If He could tell everybody that, such as eleven people, that would be tremendously helpful for me. Anyway, I would like, I would like to be the twelfth witness. So if if God would like to. Show the, me the plates and tell me in his own voice it's true. I might start taking this seriously. All right. Uh, we, wherefore, we know of a surety that the work is true. 
And we also testify that we have seen the engravings which are upon the plates, and they have been shown unto us by the power of God, and not of man. Really? Like, God had to show you the engravings? You couldn't just look at them? Well, that's... Huh. And we declare with words of soberness that an angel of God came down from heaven, and he brought and laid before our eyes that we behold and saw the plates and the engravings thereon, and we know that it is by the grace of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ that we be held and bear record of these things are true. It is marvelous in our eyes. Nevertheless, the voice of the Lord commanded us that we should bear record of it. Wherefore, to be obedient unto the commandments of God, we bear testimony of these things, and we know that if we are faithful in Christ, we shall rid our garments of the blood of all men, and be found spotless before the judgment seat of Christ, and shall dwell with him eternally in the heavens. And the honor be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which is one God. Amen. And the names are Oliver Crowdley, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris. So, great. Yeah, again, you know, if you're going to provide a testimony, right, you should just put down specifically what happened. So, we entered this address. Um, the, the roof was ripped off, and a ghostly image came down from the sky and landed in front of us. And placed on a blanket these plates and like tell us what happened, right? All they're saying is like, well, this must be true because of God and stuff. And that's not really a testimony. That's like opinion and faith-based statements. All right. Well, what are you gonna do? Um, so now we have the testimony of eight witnesses, which this is shorter, so that's good. Be it known to all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, unto whom this work shall come, that Joseph Smith. There's that June again. Joseph Smith, comma, J-U-N. I've got to look what that means. I don't know. Anyway, we're just going to drop it for now. That Joseph Smith, the translator of this work, has shown unto us the plates of which hath been spoken, which have the appearance of gold, and as many of the leaves as the said Smith has translated, we did handle with our own hands, and we also saw the engravings thereon, all of which has the appearance of ancient work and of curious workmanship. And this we bear record with the words of soberness, that the said smith has shown unto us, for we have seen and hefted, and we know the surety that the said smith has got the plates for which we have spoken. Good Lord, they've said like ten sentences, we saw plates. Joseph Smith showed us some plates, and they had some old stuff on them. And we give our names unto the world to witness unto the world which what we have seen, and we lie not, God bearing witness to it. All right, so th this, this testimony is useless. Eight people that said, we saw plates of gold. That, that's, that's what this testimony said. We, we saw it, right? Um, and these names, Christian Whitmer, Jacob Whitmer, Peter Whitmer, John Whitmer, Hiram Page, Joseph Smith Sr. Oh, J-U-N is junior. Because <laughs> Joseph Smith S-E-N is one of these eight. So that must mean senior. And J-U-N is junior. Ah, got it. And then Samuel Smith. So this is great. This Whitmer fan. One, two, three, four... Five out of the eleven witnesses are all Whitmers. Interesting. And then uh, one, two, three are Smiths, leaving only a Cowdery, Harris, and Page. So we have two families that are kind of dominating this witness thing. But, you know, whatever. So that's that's the uh, last of the testimony. The next section is the testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith. So first we have the testimony of the three witnesses, testimony of the eight, and now the prophet himself should be great. And this one is definitely longer than the other two testimonies, I'm afraid. The prophet Joseph Smith's own words about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon are, On the evening of 21st of September 1823, I betook myself to prayer and supplication to Almighty God. While I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. Okay. He had on a loose robe of the most exquisite whiteness. It was a whiteness beyond anything earthly I had ever seen, nor do I believe that any earthly thing could be made to appear so exceedingly white and brilliant. His hands were naked, and his arms also, and a little above the wrist, so also were his feet naked, as were his legs, and a little above the ankles. Okay, he's really checking out every uh, inch of him there. His head and neck were also bare. I could discover that he had no other clothing on but this robe, as it was open, 
Ooh, so that I could see into his bosom. What else could you see into? Not only was his robe exceedingly white, but his whole person was glorious beyond description, and his countenance truly like lightning. The room was exceedingly light, but not so very bright as immediately around his person. When I first looked upon him, I was afraid, but the fear soon left me. Yeah, if something like that actually appeared to me, I think fear would be a... a you shouldn't be leaving. And I love this, this just, oh, he's just so handsome, and his robe's open. I mean, I actually, like, kind of have this image of, like, Fabio floating in the air with his shirt out, and, yeah, anyway. Maybe, maybe it was Fabio, we don't know. Oh, wait, no, we're gonna, hopefully we find out this guy's name. He called me by name, and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me, and that his name was Moroni. Oh, good old Moroni. Yeah, we heard about him. His dad was Mormon, I think. Like his dad was actual Mormon, was his name, and um, yeah, he died like thousands of years ago, but now he's back as the most handsome angel ever. All right, that God had a work for me to do. That God had a work for me to do. That was a poorly worded sentence, but oh well. And that my name should be had for good and evil among nations. What? Kindred and tongues, or that it should be good and evil spoken of among the people. Whoa, I, I'm lost. My name should be had for good and evil among all nations. Well, I... All right. I guess Joseph Smith's name is going to be good and evil around the world. Strange. All right. I'm just, whatever. We'll, we'll move on past that. that. That probably meant something to other people. To me, it didn't. Uh, he said there was a book deposited written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent. <laughs> the former inhabitants, before we had mass genocide and wiped them out and put the survivors on reservations. That's great. The former inhabitants. And the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Also, that there were two stones in silver bows. And these stones, fastened to a breastplate, constituted what is called the Urim and the Thummim. Okay deposited with the plates. And the possession and use of these stones are what constituted seers in ancient or former times, and that God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. Wow. Okay, it's like they just keep adding levels of crazy. So now you have to get these stones with silver bows and fasten them to a breastplate, and then, and then, and then you can translate gold plates. That, sure, sure, that makes perfect sense <laughs> really this is what this isn't a gag book like i didn't maybe i did maybe this is like a like a parody of the book of mormon is this real okay okay can, can you just see some guy like attaching stones to like a breastplate and he's like got these silver bows he's tying to him and and i mean what would you think you'd go up and say excuse me what are you doing Oh, yes, I need these to translate gold stones because it's God's testimony to us. Yeah, how long would he be kept out of a mental hospital? Wow, a lot of people believe this. All right, again, he told me that when I got those plates of which he had spoken, for the time that they should be obtained was not yet fulfilled, I should not show them to any person, neither the bre or the breastplate with the Urim and the Thummim, only to those who I should be commanded to show them, of course, because, you know, you can't just let the whole world see this. Why, that would be bad for some reason. I mean, why can't they just still exist? Why can't I just go somewhere? Anyone open to the public. Just wait in line. You get up. You put on this breastplate. Got your rocks, right? Look at these gold plates, and you're like, I'll be damned. That's, that's right. Really? I can, I can read that now. It was gibberish before, and now it's a great testimony of God. Yeah, that's... uh. That would make, that would be great, because then you wouldn't even need, need to write this. You'd be like, yep, yeah, but no, one, one guy, and he's going to be really selective about who he tells. Okay, yep, this is clearly working God. Sounds good. If I did, I should be destroyed. Oh, if you showed anyone, so he'd be killed if he shows anybody. Of course, no witnesses. While he was conversing with me about the plates, the vision was opened to my mind that I could see the place where the plates were deposited, and that so clearly and distinctly that I knew the place again when I visited it. Okay, sure. So he didn't take you there. He didn't say, here they are. Or he didn't bring them. No, no, he just gave you an image in your mind so you could go find them yourself. Sure, sure. Man, I, get, I need to stop. 
All right. I'll, I'll, I'll start taking this a little more seriously, but it, it's hard. Okay. After this communication, I saw the light in the room begin to gather immediately around the person of him who had been speaking to me, and it continued to do so until the room was again left dark, except just around him, when instantly I saw, as it were, a conduit open up right up into heaven. And he, he ascended till he entirely disappeared, and the room was left as it had been before this heavenly light has made its appearance. So, sky opened up, Maroney just jet-packed his way back to heaven, and there you go. I lay musing on the singularity of the scene. The singularity of the scene, that's a good way of saying the craziness that just happened. And marveling greatly at what had been told to me by this extraordinary messenger, when, in the midst of my meditation, I suddenly discovered that my room was once again beginning to get lighted, and in an instant, as it were, the same heavenly messenger was again by my bedside. I guess he, I guess he's like, oh, sorry, my bad, one more thing. Wow. He commenced and again related the very same things which he had done at the first visit, without the least variation, which, having done, he informed me of the great judgments which were coming upon the earth, with great desolations by famine, sword, and pestilence, and that these grievous judgments would come on the earth in this generation. Having related these things, he again ascended as he had done before. So he popped back down and he's like, I'm going to repeat exactly what I told you before. Yeah, just going to. I, I, I don't know, maybe he has Alzheimer's or something. And, uh, yeah, and then, oh, by the way, just a little side note, it's going to be horrible, horrible things happening. Salmon, fa salmon, famine, sword, pestilence. And it's coming. Great, grievous judgments. I don't remember in the, uh, 1823, there being some massive plague that wiped out half the earth or anything like that. But, you know, I mean, things were bad. There's people die all the time, but I don't remember that generation having it particularly worse than others. But, you know, okay. So now it's a, it's a backup, shot back up into heaven. I, I swear to God, if he comes back, I'm, I'm really going to laugh. I, okay, let's see. By this time, so deep were the impressions made on my mind that sleep had fled from my eyes. Well, of course. <laughs> Did you really try to fall back asleep? Anyway. I lay overwhelmed in astonishment at what I had both seen and heard. But what was my surprise when again I behold the same messenger at my bedside and heard him rehearse <laughs> or repeat <laughs> over again to me the same things as before. This angel has, needs mental help. He just keeps coming back. I don't need to say it again. Oh, okay. The same things as before. And added a caution to me, telling me that Satan would try to tempt me. Of course he would. In consequence of the indigent circumstances of my father's family. What? Huh? Indigent circumstances? So Satan would tempt him? Well, to get the plates for the purposes of getting rich. Oh, see, I get it. Now I understand. I should have just read that whole sentence. So yeah, Satan's going to try and come to him and say, hey, those plates are going to be worth a lot of money because, you know, gold. No. This he forbade me, saying that I must have no other object in view in getting the plates but to glorify God and must not be influenced by any other motive than the building of his kingdom. Otherwise, I could not get them. So prom, prom, promise, Joseph, promise. You're uh, not going to try and make money off this, right? Right. Okay. Then you can have them. After this third visit, he again ascended into heaven as before. By angel. And I was left, and I was again left to ponder on the strangeness of what I had just experienced. Oh my god, you're not gonna believe this. When almost immediately after the heavenly messenger had ascended from me for the third time, the cock crowed, oh, okay, when I saw almost immediately I thought he's coming back. This is not happening. Alright, so thank goodness. Maroney's gone for good, it sounds like. Okay, so after he ascended the third time, the cock crowed which I believe indicates daytime. And I found that the day was approaching, so that our interviews must have occupied the whole of that night. Well, yeah, he kept coming back. Interviews? It was an interview? It sounded like he was just babbling on and then disappearing. Anyway. I shortly arose after from my bed, and as usual, went to the necessary labors of the day. Sh okay, sure. I mean, might as well get on with your life. But in attempting to work, as at other times, I found my strength so exhausted as to render me entirely unable. My father, who was laboring along with me, discovered something to be wrong with me, and told me to go home. He said, son, I, I'm looking at you, and you appear to have lost your mind. You, you appear to have gone completely insane. Perhaps you need help. That's what a good father would have said. All right. 
I started with the intention of going to the house, but in attempting to cross the fence out of the field where we were, my strength entirely failed me. Well, no, you didn't sleep at all last night. Come on. And I fell helpless on the ground, and for a time was quite unconscious of anything. It collapsed. Mm, bummer. The first thing I can recollect was a voice speaking unto me, calling me by name. I looked up, and behold, the same messenger standing over my head. He's back, ladies and gentlemen. Maroney's back. <laughs> Surrounded by light as before. And then again related to me, oh man, related unto me all that he had related to me the previous night. This guy is a broken record. And commanded me to go to my father and tell him of the vision and commandments which I had received. So Moroni, just quick, quick. I, I know, I know we don't know each other, but I'm going to give you a little bit of advice about humans, okay? Um, why would, why wouldn't it be better if you wanted Joseph Smith's father to know about this, to maybe... Oh, how, how could you have done it? I'm trying to think of a plan. Oh, I got it. Appear to him, right? You've already visited Joseph three times. Maybe go to his dad and be like, Hey, hey, just so you know, I already gave this message to your son. This is a real thing. I'm, I'm real, right? This is your, He's not going crazy. But no, went to Joseph again and said, Hey, make sure you tell your dad about this, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Moroni, I don't, I don't think it's the best strategy. I, you know, if you want Joseph Smith's dad to know and you have the power to appear from heaven in front of anybody, maybe wa make a bigger circle, you know, of people that you're going to visit. That, that would be, that would be my advice. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you take it. Okay. I obeyed. I returned to my father in the field and rehearsed the whole matter to him. He replied to me that it was of God and told me to go and do as commanded by the messenger. All right, Maroney, my bad. I didn't think that would work. I really thought it would have been better to go talk to the dad yourself, but apparently you, you, yeah, maybe you really do, you're all seeing because uh, I didn't see that working out for him. I saw Joe going to his dad saying, hey, let me tell you what I saw last night. And and dad, yeah, putting him in a straitjacket, but it worked. So, okay, can't, can't knock the results. I left the field and went to the place where the messenger had told me the plates were deposited, and owing to the distinctness of the vision which I had concerning it, I knew the place the instant that I arrived there. Convenient to the village of Manchester, Ontario County, New York, stands a hill on a considerable size, the most elevated of any in the neighborhood. On the west side of the hill, not far from the top, under a stone of considerable size, lay the plates. <laughs> deposited in a stone box. This stone was thick, and rounding in the middle on the upper side, and thin, thinner towards the edges, so that the middle part of it was visible above the ground, but the edges all around was covered with earth. What? I, I don't... How does that matter? Having removed the earth, I obtained a lever, which I got... Good lord, really descriptive. Which I got fixed under the edge of the stone, and with a little exertion raised it up, I looked in, and there indeed did I behold the plates, the urim and the thummim, and the breastplate, as stated by the messenger. Wait, 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 wait. Where's the silver ribbon? Hmm? Or bow. Silver bow. We're supposed to have. I don't know. Maybe it's in there. Maybe it's under everything else, right? The box in which they lay was formed by laying stones together in some kind of cement. In the bottom of the box were laid two stone crossways of the box, and on these stones lay the plates and the other things with them. I made an attempt to take them out, but was forbidden by the messenger. What? Really? How, he can't take it out? All right. And was again informed that the time for bringing them forth had not yet arrived, neither would it until four years from that time. Well, Maroney, why'd you come? Oh, could have come in four years. Uh, but he told me that I should have come to that place precisely in one year from that time. Wait, what? Okay, wait, wait. Neither would. The sooner time had not arrived until four years from that time, but told me I should come back to that place precisely in one year. Okay, and that he would there meet with me, and that I should continue to do so until the time should come for obtaining the plates. So every year he had to go back and look at the plates, but not take them out, and Maroney would, would have another chat. That this sounds like a very reasonable plan, I guess. No idea why you would do any of that, but... Accordingly, as I had been commanded, I went to the end of each year... And at each time I found the same messenger there and received instructions and intelligence from him at each of our interviews respecting what the Lord was going to do, how and in what manner his kingdom was to be conducted in the last days. Whew. Okay. At length, 
the time arrived for obtaining the plates. Well, not, we can quantify it. It was four years, right? The Orum and the Thummim and the Breastplate. On the 22nd day of September, on the 22nd day of September, 1,827, 1,827, why did you spell it out? Having gone as usual at the end of another year to the place where they were deposited, same old routine, going back, uh, the same heavenly messenger delivered them up to me with this charge, that I should be responsible for them, that if I should let them go carelessly or through any neglect of mine, I should be cut off, but that if I would use all my endeavors to preserve them until he, the messenger, should call for them, they should be protected. Wow, this is, this is great. I soon found out the reason why I had, had received such strict charges to keep them safe, and why it was the that the messenger has said that when I had done what was required of my hand, he would call for them. For no sooner was it known that I had them, that the most strenuous exertions were used to get them from me. What, like, everybody wanted to steal them? I guess. So that's that's why. See, he had to explain, because surely after he said this to people, they were like, well, where, where are they? Where, where are these plates? <laughs> right? It's probably, oh, no, no, no. Maroney had to come take them back, because, you know, thieves... Okay. Every stratagem that could be invented was resorted to for that purpose. The persecution became more bitter and severe than before, and the multitudes were on the alert continually to get them from me if possible. But by the wisdom of God, they remained safe in my hands until I had accomplished them by them what was required at my hand. When, according to arrangements, the messenger called for them, I delivered them up to, unto him, and he has them in his charge until this day. All right. Well, man, nobody's trying to rob Maroney, I guess. Being the second day of May, 1,838. Oh, okay. So he had him between 27 and 38 and for 11 years. Well, if he managed to keep him safe for 11 years, surely they could have stayed. Anyway. For a more complete account, see Joseph Smith, History and the Pearl of Great Price. Oh, well, I don't know. Is that a separate book? Maybe. Maybe it is. The ancient record thus brought forth from the earth as the voice of a people speaking from the dust and translated into modern speech by the gift and power of God, as attested by divine affirmation, was first published in the world in the year 1830 as the Book of Mormon. Well, that's just lovely. All right, then we're doing this one last section. It's called A Brief Explanation About the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is a sacred record of people in ancient America. It was engraved upon metal plates. Yeah, we know that. They need to look at the ordering of this book, because they, they're saying things like, anyway. Sources from which this record was compiled include the following. The plates of Nephi, which were two kinds, the small plates and the large plates. The former were the more particularly devoted to spiritual matters and the ministry and the teachings of the prophets, while the latter were occupied mostly by a secular history of the prophets concerned. I'm sorry, of the people concerned. Whew. From the time of Mosiah, however, the large plates also included items of major spiritual importance. Well, thanks for that. That's great. The plates of Mormon, which consist of an abridgment by Mormon from the large plates of Nephi with many commentaries. These plates also contained a con con continuation of the history by Mormon and additions by his son Moroni. This, I still, it's still blowing my mind that anyone takes this seriously. Number three, the plates of Ether, which present a history of the Jaredites. The, this record was abridged by Moroni, who inserted comments of his own and incorporated the record with the general history under the title Book of Ether. Great. This is almost done, guys. The plates of brass, number four, the plates of brass brought by the people of Lehi from Jerusalem in 600 BC. These contain the five books of Moses and also a record of the Jews from the beginning down to the commencement of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, and also the prophecies of the holy prophets. Many quotations from these plates citing Isaiah and other biblical and non-biblical prophets appear in the Book of Mormon. What, I don't... So are the plates of brass the first five books of the Bible? I guess? Uh, well, I guess, I guess we'll find out, because we're going to read this whole thing. The Book of Mormon comprises 15 main parts or division known, with one exception, as books. Usually designated by the name of their particular author, the first portion of the six books, ending with Omni, is a translation from the small plates of Nephi. Between the books of Omni and Mosiah is an insert called the Words of Mormon. 
This insert connects the record engraved on the small plates with Mormon's abridgment of the larger plates. Oh, I should have skipped this section. This is really boring. I'm sorry. Almost done. Well, not really. A couple more paragraphs. The longer portion from Mosea through Mormon, chapter 7, is a translation of Mormon's abridgment of the large plates of Nephi. The concluding portion from Mormon, chapter 8, to the end of the volume, was engraved by Mormon's son Moroni, who, after finishing the record of his father's life, made an abridgment of the Jaredite record as the Book of Ether, and later added the parts known as the Book of Moroni. Ugh, this is so boring. It, it, I have to admit, as as just crazy insane as as Joseph Smith's testimony was there like that was it was entertaining right I thought it was I mean it was it was funny this is just torture all right power through in or about the year AD 421 Moroni the last of the Nephite prophet historians sealed the sacred record and hid it up under the Lord to be brought forth in the latter days as predicted by the voice of God through his ancient prophets in AD 1823 the same Moroni then a resurrected personage I guess I don't use the word angel or ghost, a re resurrected personage, visited the prophet Joseph Smith and subsequently delivered the engraved, engraved plates to him. Well, four years later, but yeah, minor. About this edition, oh, there's more than one edition? Okay. The original title page immediately preceding the contents page is taken from the plates and is part of the sacred text. Introductions in a non-italic typeface, such as in 1 Nephi and immediately preceding Mosiah chapter 9, are also part of the sacred text. Isn't this all part of the sacred text? Weird. Uh, I don't know. Introductions in italics, such as in chapter headings, are not original to the text. Ah, but our study helps, included for the convenience in reading. Well, what do you say, guys? If there's italicized text, it's not really. It's just, like, helpful stuff. Should we read it? I don't know. I guess I'll read it, but I'll make sure I'll tell you. Italics. All right. This is kind of cool. It's kind of like these are the rules of reading our book. Some minor errors in the text have been per perpetuated in past editions of the Book of Mormon. This edition contains corrections that seem appropriate to bring the material into conformity with pre-publication manuscripts and early editions edited by the Prophet Joseph Smith. Hmm. Hmm. That last paragraph makes you pause, doesn't it? There's some errors in the text before in this holy, you know, inerrant book, but we fixed them. That's, hmm, okay. All right, everybody, that is going to do it for today. Um, I kind of felt like that was all, like, kind of intro stuff, you know, get, just get you, get you excited for what's to come. Because our next episode, we are going to begin reading the first book of Nephi. So this should be exciting. I hope. Hope it's exciting. We'll see. Um, but anyway, until then, I hope you guys are enjoying this so far. And uh, we will be back soon. Bye. This song is licensed for use within this podcast. All song and copyright information can be found at www.mybookofmormonpodcast.com. Oh,